You're listening to sounds recorded on the raised walkways of the Barbican Estate, possibly the most ambitious architectural statement made in the UK in the 20th century. This is Talking Volumes. I'm Ewan Russell. And I'm Freya Dugan. In this episode, we explore the layers of meaning to be found not only in the radical form of the Barbican, but also in the overlapping ideas behind it. First up, Talking Volumes host Reuben J. Brown discusses how he first arrived at this unique urban landscape. It's hard to convey the ambition and scale of the Barbican with words. Every dimension seems amplified by the density of the streets and buildings around it. The site takes up a vast chunk of the north of the city of London, the UK's financial centre, a borough whose land is split into little parcels where every building is a statement and must in some way individuate itself from the others. The towers here are called by nicknames derived from their monolithic shapes, the cheese grater, the trellis, the gherkin, the walkie-talkie. These are steel and glass properties, extracting maximum land value from the curved and diagonal plots afforded by the ancient road network of the inner city. Cycling from London Bridge to the Barbican is to pass between the canyons of these glass offices and the solidity of national bank branches in classical stone. You can feel the money. The buildings are clean, pure, reliable, unmoving and unmoved. Particularly on the weekend and in the pandemic, when all the office workers are at home, the city is like a static ghost town. Its buildings are distinctly unliving and unlivable, their purpose entirely in service of wealth. Which makes the Barbican feel like something of a miracle, a distinctive place in a sea of meaningless spaces. Where, in the canyons of the city roads leading to it, the buildings are one-dimensional, their facades and their images offering didactic expressions of the wealth they serve. In the Barbican, the body is overwhelmed by the complexity, the layers of meaning and interpretation. Its vision is holistic. It's not just a building, but the definition of a lifestyle. A network of upside-down terrace houses and three-level flats wrapped around access corridors and triangular spiral staircases rising to infinity, and sculptural semicircular water fountains in garden squares. And that's before we get to the library, the theatre, art centre, conservatory, all overlapping in textured concrete masses and purple clay tiles. This is architecture as utopia, architecture that believes in itself as a way of life, architecture that wants you to feel how it's affecting you, that more than an image to be seen on a skyline is a world to be lost in. Are you trying to get out? Trying to get in. Oh, get, in. get in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? Yes. Um, in, into where? Barbican. Vera and I had come south from Alexandra Palace on the tube to meet Reuben. While she'd been to the Barbican many times, this was my first experience of it. And coming out of the underground, the first thing I saw were the towers, Lauderdale, Shakespeare and Cromwell. Even without the preceding eight weeks in the uniform flatness of Cambridge, I would have been surprised by their height. And it was impossible to see where any of this concrete landed amongst the fortress below. We definitely weren't meeting Reuben up there, so my eyes returned to the busy junction in front of us as we came out from underneath the raised walkway that was already on top of us. While the towers, residential blocks and high walks are easy to see from outside the Barbican, physical entrances into its walls are difficult to find. From the road, it's hard to see where the human body could fit into buildings on this scale. Freya had a rough idea of the way in. We crossed the junction and headed towards a car tunnel which lets normal London traffic rush under the Barbican. On the right-hand wall of this tunnel was an opening that felt like a side gate. Once through this, we took a flight of stairs to the high walks, none of which seemed directed towards where we were meeting Reuben, which for me was still a vague idea of the Barbican centre. I had thought that high walks would be about direct paths to and from where you need to go, but in reality there's something confused and confusing about how they guide you through the Barbican. They'll lead you on with intent before bringing you to a dead end or a large open space, which gives you no further instruction. We were already a little late for meeting Reuben, which only made us more aware of always feeling lost. But lifted above the road and surrounded by constant material reminders of where you are, being lost doesn't feel wrong. In the Barbican, you're lost, but within the safe, controlled parameters of the estate. Residence only, one of the only messages communicated by signs here, helped us to find a route almost by process of elimination. 
We passed into a low ceiling space beneath the weight of a residential block which fell underground but was still at the level of the high walks raised above something unknown. In this ambiguous space, it was unclear where to wear a mask or where social distancing arrows were directing you. We came out at what I later realised was the iconic Gilbert Bridge which passes over the central lake and under duplex apartments. This is where we finally saw Ruben, sitting below on the lakeside terrace. We waved down to him, aware that despite our proximity, we probably wouldn't be there for another five or ten minutes. As people who had little knowledge of the layout, we experienced the Barbican a little like a maze, trying different paths until we found ones that worked. I expected the Barbican to feel playful, but just as much as we were playing with the architecture, it was playing with us. For me, the experience of finding Ruben created a mood of play and indirectness, changing how I interacted with the city. Later, skating in another underbuilding high walk, we saw how the playfulness of the Barbican influenced the social relations of the people using it. Lingering at the bottom of a ramp, discussing how we felt about the space, we noticed it was almost impossible for people to walk down without saying something to us, whether asking for the way out or seeing what we were doing. It was as if we all felt obliged to break the silence of the passageway with something other than our footsteps. We finally met Ruben 25 minutes late and experienced the architecture's playfulness together on a different scale, skating along the terrace and hopping over the stepping stones and circular fountains which line the edge of the lake. There was this challenging ambiguity around what we were allowed to do. Was it okay to skate across the plaza or jump across the fountain pools or lock Ruben's bike to a lamppost you could only reach by multiple sets of stairs? And who would tell us off if it wasn't? This only increased the feeling of playfulness and created opportunities for excitement and maybe danger within the broader context of safety. Amongst the codification and control of central London, this experience was refreshing. Here was a place not designed for production and consumption, but for experience and interaction. While, as in most spaces, commercial interests are present, the Barbican feels like it contains flexibility for resistance. Resistance that we carried out through play. There's still a sense of conflict felt between the public realm and the private, the line between them drawn confidently with bold block capital letters, residence only, where all other distinctions in the space are left unsigned and unenforced. To meet Professor James Campbell, head of the Art History and Architecture Department at the University of Cambridge, we left the Barbican complex and went back down to ground level at the tube station entrance. James, a resident of nearly three decades, asked us to meet here because he said it would be almost impossible for us to find the entrance to his building ourselves. By the end of our tour with him, I'd started to pick up on the resident-specific sociolec to describe the estate's geography, but at the start of the day, I didn't even know what language I'd use to agree on a place to meet there. This tour showed us another side of the Barbican, the side which only residents get to see behind those tall capital letters on big white signs. <laughs> we passed through one of the gates which are only accessible to us. Hang out. We'd pass behind fountains and up into hidden walkways or enter a seating area concealed inside the lake. Entering the massive multi-storey car parks hidden below and behind residential blocks, the specificity of the Barbican's concrete and iconic volumes would peel away to reveal a mundane, purely functional architecture. Bare-faced concrete without the makeup of labour-intensive surface treatments ornamenting the rest of the site. As the sun set, we took hot teas up to the balcony on one of the towers, climbing the triangular stairwell into its vanishing point, further and further away from the ground, or whatever the ground means in the Barbican. The view was overwhelming, simply colossal and soaked in a winter sunset from the southwest. After a day spent lost inside layered corridors and ambiguous spaces, the confines of the estate had felt vast, but here it was shown within the scale of London. People were too small to be seen and the city was laid out like a model, from Elephant and Castle to the South Bank, St Paul's Cathedral and Alexandra Palace. The networks of passages and podiums of the Barbican that we'd been willingly lost in before were presented in their entirety. It seemed to make more logical sense from above, but this was a delusion. What you see from the towers is one ground of many. 
While an undeniable privilege, I was so struck by the view I forgot to drink my tea. This top-down plan view didn't connect with the three-dimensionality of our experience with James. Even the famous 1970 cross-section of the Barbican, which cuts through the onion layer floor planes of the theatre and art centre, doesn't give the full story, presenting an image of connectivity between different users and uses. But as the Barbican showed us, being spatially close to someone doesn't necessarily connect you. The experience of the estate is often defined by division, between high walk and pavement, tower and masonettes, public and private, those who are lost and those who've learned the building's secret code. After dark, we walked out of the estate through the city, looking for somewhere to get a drink. Hospitality venues in London were allowed to be open at the time, and it was 6pm on a Saturday night, but the Wood Street pub at the foot of the Gilbert Bridge was closed, as most of the shops, offices and businesses we passed have been since the start of the pandemic. We had to reach St Paul's before seeing many people beyond board office reception security guards, and I started to understand the Barbican as an enclave or a fortress of life within the space of a city centre based on an economy which, unlike the Barbican, felt unlikely to emerge from the pandemic the same as it had before. An idea central to the Barbican's conception is that of the blank slate. An old city wiped clean and rebuilt in a unified, modernised, rationalised, utopian vision. In the 1920s, it was Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier who wildly promoted the idea of tearing down the old central Paris to create such a blank slate, a tabula rasa, on which to build a series of skyscrapers to house three million people. Corbusier's ideas in the Plan Voisin were deliberately provocative, an opportunity to devise a perfect form for a city which could be applied anywhere in the world so long as an empty piece of land was available. What is created by blank slate planning is something inherently top-down. The architect is given a plain sheet of paper and allowed to draw whatever they desire. And what do you do with no context, no inspiration? The architect may hand back the plain white sheet and pick up graph paper instead, composing grids and geometries, order and control. A city which looks so clean and so perfect on a map. But from the street, the scene is different. This master planning might enforce a particular uniform pattern of living, inflexible to changing times, technologies, and ways of being. In most of Europe, however, the plans of Corbusier and others remain just plans. Paris was not keen on the idea of tearing down its historical centre to start again. The result may have been perfect in the architect's eyes, but not in anyone else's. And however utopian it may have been to live there, it would no longer have been Paris. It is in this context that the site of the Barbican emerges, though not through choice. On the 29th of December 1940, the old streets and terraces were razed to the ground by bombing. What remained was a flattened field of weeds and rubble in the heart of an ancient city. Corbusier's fantasy, a blank slate. Well, sort of. Whatever utopia that could be constructed within the Barbican, it would have to, in some way, connect to the rest of the old, disorganised city that had been spared by the Blitz. The Roman London Wall from 200 AD runs through the south of the site, and St Paul's Cathedral is just a short walk away. Now, for a moment, a slight tangent to consider the animated science fiction show Futurama. Which takes place a thousand years in the future in a city called New New York. People and robots travel around in flying cars and pressurised tubes. Blobby, colourful buildings tower into the sky. But dig below street level and you will find old New York, or to us, New York City. In the lore of the show, old New York was destroyed in 2308, and a new ground floor built above it. The tip of the Empire State Building pokes out to street level and into the futuristic new city. What bearing does this have on the Barbican? Well, when James was touring us around the estate, even when we thought we were truly at the bottom, in the grassy private gardens, we were still many floors above the foundations. There were train tracks and car parks and the ruins of the old city still below us. The building's iconic concrete columns extending further and further downwards out of view. Much like new New York, the Barbican has created for itself a new ground floor, a new zero. 
Inside the estate, street level is the network of walkways and open spaces known as the podium, where the access to most flats can be found. The podium is free of cars and traffic lights, free from the noise and the dirt and the danger of the old streets. It is a unique urban landscape with a pedestrian at its heart. You find children learning to ride bikes or playing violin, fashion students doing photo shoots. The podium is more than just liminal space to pass through, but public space in its own right. The truly fascinating thing about the podium, however, is not the space itself, but the unrealized spaces it was supposed to connect with. James told us that a core reason why people find the Barbican so inaccessible and hard to navigate is that it was built with the assumption of the podium extending far outwards into the city of London. Up to 30 miles of elevated walkways were proposed in 1963. You could have walked all the way from Blackfriars Station or the Tower of London through Finsbury Circus or St Paul's Cathedral itself, right into the Barbican without touching the floor. If Utopia required a blank slate and you couldn't raise the old city to the ground, what if you raised up the ground itself? In this way, the Barbican is only a half-realised idea, a utopian vision for a new urbanity which segregates the dirty, dangerous domain of the automobile, the sewer, and the underground railway from the domain of the human. And it is so attractive in some ways. The Barbican does feel clean, safe, relaxed, the pace of movement through it a little slower, more considered, giving you time to notice the spaces around you and how you're affected by them, aided by the blue noise of fountains and waterfalls. The old street level becomes more like a railway track, a transport conduit for the car, while the new zero of these streets in the sky can be an urban space that's actually livable. But if architects were creating a whole new, perfect pedestrian layer, then the streets below could hack away at their pavements and trees and traffic lights and create their own perfection for the car. Former City of London chief planner Peter Rees has even said that, rather than creating a pedestrian paradise, the high walks were, quote, simply about getting people out of the way in order to speed up traffic flow. And soon after the plan was devised, the impossibility of creating a new blank slate above the old, complicated network of land ownership in an ancient city became clear, and the Barbican's podium was left an island surrounded by dual carriageways. Its own raised walkways are almost useless to anyone but its residents or visitors to the art centre, and its vision of utopia is inaccessible and confusing. And in this vein, within each utopia is a kernel of dystopia. For the Barbican, this comes from the controversial architecture of brutalism. I've been thinking about the definition of brutalism and the Barbican's relation to it since our first discussions for this episode in September. As a Londoner, I've been aware of the Barbican since a year three school trip to a shoe factory, using the terrace by the fountains as a lunch spot. From then, I would always ask my parents if we could stop when I saw the Barbican name on the tube. But since I've gained a deeper understanding of brutalism, I've struggled to place the Barbican amongst other brutalist buildings. I know Goldfinger's Trellick and Balfour Towers, Alison and Peter Smithson's Robin Hood Gardens and Dennis Lasden's National Theatre seem to be overtly brutal in a way that the Barbican isn't. Despite this, in the Art Centre's gift shop, t-shirts, mugs and sustainable tote bags are sold with the word brutal printed on a white on black block capital sans serif, not unlike the font on the residence only signs found throughout the site. Is the Barbican really brutal, or is it just co-opting the term to claim a gritty urban heritage that it never truly had? Mid-century architecture critic Rainer Banham was the first to offer a definition of the brutalist style. In 1959, he commented on its three defining characteristics. Memorability as an image, a clear exhibition of structure and how it stands up, and critically, a use of materials as raw, the French brew of brutalism. The Barbican as a highly striking building with its massive columns and structures visibly displayed and its concrete left unclad seems to fit these criteria. But while the concrete may be unclad, I wouldn't describe it as raw. The architects initially wanted to use decadent white marble for the building's facades, which proved to be too expensive. But the austerity of a raw, untreated concrete surface would feel too hard, perhaps too brutal for the Barbican. Instead, every concrete surface in the estate was hand hammered during construction to give it a pitted, varied surface, softening the appearance of the material and the light. Well, John Borton in his book, The Rise and Fall of Council Housing, writes that the term has become a more encompassing descriptor for the 1960s concrete architecture of the welfare state. 
brutalism was a cheap way of building quickly on a large scale in a post-war Britain that needed rebuilding. And the star was frequently applied to council housing, hospitals, comprehensive schools and the university expansions. And through this lens, the Barbican's definition as brutal is less clear. Exactly. The Barbican's rents were set at market rates and its intentions weren't aligned to the prevailing idea for neighbourhoods of mixed social classes in council developments at the time. It may have been housing built by a council, the City of London Corporation, but it isn't council housing. In 1959, the architects themselves said that they were targeting young professionals, likely to have a taste for Mediterranean holidays, French food and Scandinavian design. A new site for a private school, which today attracts tuition fees up to £19,000 a year in the City of London School for Girls, was a central part of the project from the start. The architects wanted residents and schoolgirls to feel safe from the dangers of the city, its roads, pollution and strangers. Therefore, while there is no literal gate stopping you from entering the state, it can feel like a gated community, an enclave of safety and serenity within the dirt and the danger of the city. So while the Barbican was a symbol of safety, wealth and style during the 70s and particularly into the Thatcher years of the 80s, brutalism as a style became the symbol of the supposed failure of council housing. Concrete tower blocks became increasingly associated with antisocial behaviour, neoliberalist code for poverty, crime and vandalism. This fall of council housing is a complicated and difficult story. But in brief, the perception of council-owned housing rented on regulated, lifelong leases fell. From Labour politician Nye Bevan's lofty 1949 description of a living tapestry of mixed community for the general needs of all in society, to a service of last resort by the late 70s. In this era of last resort, council housing developments quickly became, quote, problem estates, as their populations were increasingly composed of people struggling in the context of an economic recession and the shrinking industrial economy which had provided employment for the British working classes for close to a century. Council housing at the time was varied, from detached brick cottages to tall brutalist tower blocks, and the effect of its purpose as a last resort was felt by all types of estates. But a paper written by academic Alice Coleman sought to link certain design features of council estates with antisocial behaviour, deep in the Thatcherite notion that there is no society, only men, women and families. Coleman believed that the ideal housing type was a detached two-storey cottage with a garden to allow the family to have clearly defined borders of ownership and control, while the shared corridors and staircases of tower blocks created dangerous hiding places for criminals. Coleman's research became very influential. She met with Thatcher in 1986 and received a grant of £50 million to trial her ideas in the real world. But her methodology was flawed, at no point acknowledging that critical factor of poverty in her analysis. In 1990, the Meadowell riots erupted out of a council estate of two-storey cottage homes with gardens, the very sort that Coleman had claimed as perfect for social order. It was triggered by last Friday's crash in which two car thieves, 21-year-old Colin Atkins and Dale Robson, who was 17, died while being pursued by police. There's nothing at all for anyone to do on the estate, you know. The government rate cap and the local councils had to close the community centre down there. And that's added to the problem. People's got nowhere to go, you know, the local community, um, the youths and everything. On the Where unemployment and crime rates were among the highest in the country. But by that point, the particular association of high-rise and brutalism with antisocial behaviour was embedded, and the fall of council housing inevitable. We can describe this trend in the perception of council housing, and particularly the modernist blocks of it, as one of demonisation, intrinsically linked to class and neoliberal politics. And for its distinctive quality as visually striking, brutalism was an easy scapegoat, a symbol of all that was wrong with council housing and the overreach of the state into the lives of its citizens. And this demonisation wasn't just a political or academic affair either. Many of the preconceived ideas about brutalism present in Coleman's research are reflections of wider cultural uses of brutalist architecture at the time. Of course, the striking image of brutalist buildings are incredibly cinematic and evocative, Brutalist spaces are rare, unique, futuristic, lending themselves perfectly to the form of the dystopia. And, as we've talked about, the Barbican and other brutalist buildings are very active forms of architecture, operating a certain form of control over their users engaged in top-down and blank slate conceptions of space. I might argue that lots of urban architectures have a certain control over how their users live and move and that the dramatic novelty and radicalism of the way brutalism does that, by meaningfully breaking from the British paradigm of cottages and terraces, is far more noticeable. Yeah, for sure. 
J.G. Ballard's 1975 dystopian novel, High Rise, drives its plot through the inequalities and social hierarchy represented by the occupation of different levels of a high-rise tower, inspired by the Barbican's triangular blocks. The residents of the upper floors have an unspoken control over the lifts and the swimming pools, resulting in class warfare and violence, facilitated by the layout of the building. As you said, the architecture is an active presence in the narrative, imposing a particular way of living. The residents naturally submit to the divided and hierarchical nature of the structure, which supposedly causes crime and chaos. In Ben Wheatley's 2015 film adaptation, the jutting curved concrete balconies of the Barbican's towers are instantly recognisable. And of course, there's Stanley Kubrick's 1971 film adaptation of A Clockwork Orange, using the brutalist Brunel University and South Mirror State as the setting for graphic scenes of dystopia, anarchy and the state-ordered brainwashing. In this case, architecture is not specifically to blame for violence as it is in High Rise, but instead serves as a physical embodiment of the technocratic totalitarian state and as a warning against brutalism as a form. The 1971 disaster classic, The Towering Inferno, Cronenberg's 1975 movie, Shivers, 1983's De Lift and 84's Abwarts all demonise the concrete high-rise and reflect wider fears and apprehensions about modernist housing schemes outside of the visions of the architects of the 1960s and 70s. It's also worth considering again the Cold War context of brutalism and the Soviet variant of the style, against which British brutalism is comparatively tame, unimaginative even. From an outside view, it's easy to think of brutalism as the architecture of authoritarian communism, the type of society often alluded to by mid-century dystopias. Nikita Khrushchev's solution to the Soviet housing crisis was to construct tens of thousands of concrete Khrushchevka apartment buildings. The goal was to provide a home for every Soviet citizen, but all of those homes would have the same cramped living quarters and meagre facilities. To the neoliberalist trend of freeing capitalist markets from regulation and letting the council tenant buy their houses at reduced rates, this vision of modern housing was anathema and highly resisted. So we have the British societal and political context of council housing becoming a last resort measure, leading to rising crime levels and, quote, problem estates, meeting with the cultural perception of brutalism as the architecture of authoritarian communism and dystopia. Meanwhile, councils didn't have the resources to properly maintain their concrete buildings and the quality of the structures themselves started to deteriorate. In all, we had the decline and demonisation of council housing, with brutalism as the particular icon of the failures of the welfare state, and a British flirtation with socialism under the 1970s Labour government, who promised to cause a fundamental irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people and their families. But the Barbican was not a council estate. Its design imperatives not simply about efficiency and low cost, but about attracting wealthy, discerning professionals into the city. With one 1970s brochure running the tagline, How to Make Senior Executives Happy in London, over a drawing of the Barbican's sunken gardens next to the dome of St Paul's Cathedral. Where the brutalist Park Hill in Sheffield or Robin Hood Gardens in London were estates that provided housing as a last resort, the Barbican was built for clients who may have already owned a second home in the countryside. Today, Robin Hood Gardens is demolished, while the Barbican Residence magazine runs jokes about male flat owners feeling emasculated by the yearly increase in their property value being greater than their yearly salary. Really, it's a difficult read. And this is where, today, the clash of brutalism and council housing becomes problematic. One of London's most famed brutalist buildings is Balfour Tower, part of the Brownfield Council estate in Tower Hamlets, so well known for its iconic streets in the sky hanging between the separated service towers and the block of flats. In the last decade, all social housing residents have been forced to leave. It was my own front door and my own independence. It was my home. And I thought I was going to spend the rest of my days there. And the homes built for working class Londoners have been sold off to a trendy, affluent crowd the 21st century equivalent to the target audience of the Barbican in the 60s and 70s, using the once demonised brutalist star as a selling point. This is gentrification, plain and simple, reaching towards a more marketable soft brutalism. A soft brutalism found in the Barbican from its conception, or the visual star and avant-garde design bravado, but dressed up in hand-textured concrete, hanging plants, fountains and sunken gardens in the lake. So, in a sense, the Barbican was built explicitly to block out the dirt and grime and brutality of the city, as a castle for the wealthy. 
but it now romanticizes the dirt and grime and brutality of brutalism into something trendy and attractive. It's something to be sold in the form of expensive fade-on brutalist photo books and slogan tote bags in the gift shop, or something that performs the act of selling. The barber can frequently used in fashion shoots as a stage set for youthful rebellious urbanity. I think it's important to not take these ideas as explicit criticisms of the Barbican. We each think it is successful architecture. Exciting, courageous, fun, yet still deeply considered and mature. More than this, what the Barbican has revealed to us through the six months we've been thinking about it are the challenging intersections of ideas, experience, spaces, politics, history that rise in the legacy of a work of architecture that seeks its own agenda and critiques the prevailing constructions and conceptions of space and the city in any given era. We've understood the Barbican as an antagonist to, and respite from, the lifeless corporate architecture of the surrounding city of London, as a vision for an urban environment oriented to value through use, not through exchange. In fact, we can consider the Barbican as a living architecture in itself, which plays with you as much as you can play with it. We've understood the Barbican through its challenging foundation in blank slate planning as a utopian vision, and the kernel of dystopia within that utopia. And we've understood the Barbican in its flexible relationship to the architectural style of brutalism through film, literature, academia, and the changing role and demonization of council housing in the late 20th century. It is these layers of meaning to be found in the Barbican that leave our impressions of it unresolved. Much like the layered planes of the Barbican stacked spaces, the layers of meaning in the ideas represented by it run up, down, adjacent, diagonal, through time and through many fields of knowledge. In the flat plains of the City of London's steel and glass skyscrapers, architecture claims to be apolitical, serving to enable and continue the economic and social systems in which it was designed. There is only so much to be said about a building like the Gherkin. Perhaps its engineering is daringly impressive, its silhouette instantly recognisable on the skyline, but its uniqueness is skin deep. Beyond its surface, it serves no confrontation to the ways we live, work, and experience life in our neoliberal capitalist society. Rather, it enables the continuing reproduction of that society. But in the Barbican, architecture presents a meaningful critique. A critique of prioritisation of the car above the pedestrian. A critique of the dirt and dangers of the city. A critique of the family unit in a two-storey cottage home with an individual garden. And where architecture critiques, architecture invites engagement, confrontation, conversation, invites us to pause and consider how the arrangement of volume, material, structure affects our experience of talking with our friends, learning to ride a bike, or walking to work. Our lives. And the Barbican, still standing today, a place you can just walk into, despite some difficulty, is a reminder that at one point, and not so long ago, daring, large-scale architecture proposed alternatives. We would like to sincerely thank James Campbell for his time and generosity in giving us an insider's tour of the Barbican. Our understanding of the space would have been severely limited without him. James's books on the architectural histories of libraries, bricks and St Paul's Cathedral are published by Thames and Hudson. City of London worker Alan Carter also gave us his time for an interview about his experiences commuting through the Barbican. It's safe to say his opinions on architecture are a distance away from ours, but his perspective was very useful for understanding how the Barbican interacts with the rest of the city, and we'd like to thank him for his time. John Borton's book, Municipal Dreams, The Rise and Fall of Council Housing, has been an invaluable resource for understanding council housing and its intersection with brutalism. We all think it's a brilliantly written, vital history of British council homes that's so important to understanding the housing crisis of today. And if you're interested in the ideas about pedestrian streets raised off the ground present in the Barbican's elevated walkways, the American twin cities of Minneapolis and St Paul each have much more developed networks of climate-controlled skyways. The podcast 99% Invisible recently ran an episode on them and how they interact with the politics of race, class and American suburbia. Other than that, this episode of Talking Volumes was produced in Brighton by me, Ruben J. Brown. In Durham by me, Ewan Russell. And in London by me, Barry Dugan. 
You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Talking Volumes and send emails to talkingvolumespod at gmail.com. A summary of this episode, photographs from the Barbican, and links to everything we've referenced are available at this episode's page on our website, talkingvolumes.co.uk. All music for this episode was produced by me and Ewan, except for the Futurama theme song, of course. You'll hear from us soon.